I'm excited about this week. I'm excited about what God's going to do in your lives, in the life of our church, the life of our city. I believe this may be one of the most important times in history. I don't say that casually. I was in my prayer room yesterday, and God just said to me that you're standing on the brink of history-making times. History-making times. Times that they're going to write books about. Times when families will literally change direction. The history of families is going to be rewritten this year. Wow. There may, there may have been 50 years of chaos and confusion. But God said this year it gets rewritten. This year it gets rewritten. Hallelujah. So I'm excited about what's going to happen this year. Thank you for praying for my wife today. She's home, not feeling well, and we just bless her in Jesus' name. Pastor Cole's not well. So we just believe in God for healing for everybody in our, on our teams, your house today. Would you stand with me one more time? I just want to read together. If it's okay, I'm going to take the uh, next few minutes and just um, open my heart to you about something um, that I just, if I could sit down with you across the table, I'd like to talk to you about. And God's been talking to us on our team, and we've talked about this now for several months, that in 2019, we were supposed to recalibrate the culture of our house, and that there's some things that uh, God said to us very strongly that we were to place emphasis on because that's who we are supposed to be as a people. I don't believe the gate church is supposed to be like every other church. Mm -hmm. If every church is the same, how many of you know somebody's unnecessary? Mm -hmm. So I don't compete with our brothers. We rejoice over them because we know they have a place in our city, in our nation, in our state. We have incredible people. In fact, I just want to, you can pray with me about this. This Thursday night, uh, Pastor Terry Bates at Faith and myself are hosting a dinner for pastors from all over Oklahoma City. And uh, we believe that God just said to us, it's time for Oklahoma City to come together. And so we've got guys from the greater Metroplex area that are coming together Thursday night for no agenda. Other than he did tell me this week I'm speaking to them, so I didn't know that. But anyway, uh, we are coming together to basically just love on each other, to build relationships, and to break down walls and barriers. Because here's what I learned a long time ago. I learned this traveling the nations of the world. The greater the unity, the greater the power. To the degree a city lived in unity, whatever, if the, if the city could get in 70% unity, there was a release of power that would be greater. If they could get in 100% unity, how many of you know that happens in the life of a church? It happens in the life of a home. And so I just believe it's exceptional for us to be pulling together because the history of Oklahoma City is that there's been incredible amounts of competition, division, strife. There's been a lot. Of things there would be there would be people come to our city who had been in Tulsa two or three days earlier they'd go to Tulsa and 5,000 people would show up for a citywide meeting come to Oklahoma City and 500 would show up even though our city is almost twice as big and it was because there was such strife and division in our city how many of you know it's easy for people sometimes because we live in a city for people to move from place to place and they take their hurts from wherever they came from and next thing you know, we have Splinter Church. Come on, is this okay? Can I keep talking? But I believe God's going to say, this year I'm ending all that. I'm bringing unity to Oklahoma City. I'm bringing a year of significant breakthrough in Oklahoma. Hallelujah. This is not going to be a land forsaken. God said he's going to water the dry and thirsty ground. Hallelujah. So it starts this week. And for us as a house here, one of the things that God spoke to us so firmly is that we are not to be casual about prayer. We're not to be casual about prayer. 
Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6 is a very familiar passage of Scripture. It says, without faith, living within us, I'm reading from the uh, Passion Translation, without faith living within us, it would be impossible to please God. Let me just say to everybody in the room, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what does it take to please God? Somebody to believe him. I ain't got no help. We've made things very, very difficult. Sometimes we think you, to please God, I gotta turn two flips, three, three, sing three songs, throw a $10 bill over my shoulder, fall out. No, God said, here's what you gotta do to please me. Believe me. If you believe me, you'll please me. For we come to God in faith, knowing that he is real and he rewards the faith of those who give all their passion and strength into seeking him. James said in James chapter five, verse number 16, he said the effective, fervent prayer of righteous men avail much. I want to begin a series called Critical Mass. Critical Mass is when everything aligns itself properly, all the elements that are necessary to become a tipping point, everything that's necessary for an explosion to happen. How many of you know when, when certain things happen with atoms and neutrons and, and protons they, they're very, very small, but when they line up properly and combine themselves, there's an atomic reaction that creates a cloud and an earth-shattering breakthrough that breaks up things everywhere. And I heard the Lord say to me in prayer several months ago, we're going to reach critical mass at the gate church. Things that have never been broke through are going to be broke through. Things that have never been experienced are going to be experienced. And we're going to see the glory of God in late ways like never before. Will we be in agreement about that today? Yes. I want to teach for a few minutes on about what it means to be fervent. Father, thank you today for the ability to preach and teach. And I pray over these next few minutes that you'll saturate this room with your presence. Fill us with your, with your revelation. Let your glory rest upon us today. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. I thank you for the ability to communicate what you've said to me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Why don't you high five two or three people and tell them we're going to learn what it means to be fervent. Jonathan, just stay right there, would you? Just stay there for a minute. I hope if you've got a piece of paper or a pencil or a phone that you keep notes on, whatever it is, that you'll get it in your hands. The series that we're entering into, we'll take the next five weeks and talk about what is it that creates critical mass in our life? What is it that brings that, that breaking or that tipping point in our life where things that look like they couldn't happen begin to happen? Now, I want to say something to you up front. This series of messages is only for those who are serious about living victorious. If people are content to live bound, frustrated, depressed, then I'm going to probably frustrate you more because I'm going to talk to people about how to live, how the Bible teaches us we've been called to live. I believe there are people in this room that will recognize that we're in the fight of our life. We have a real enemy. He has strategized and he has schemed against you. He strategized and schemed against your emotions, your mind, your family, and your future. God spoke a prophetic word to me that I, I don't think there's probably three times in 40 years of preaching I've ever done this, but I was so moved by it, I got a piece of paper and began to write because I wanted to make sure I delivered it to this house appropriately. But there's a disclaimer before I share it. How many of you ever see, you ever see the commercials on television 
where they come out with a new, whether it's a medicine or whatever, the first 15 seconds they show you how it's going to make you feel better and everything's wonderful. And then the next 45 seconds is somebody talking real fast of all the things. <laughs> right? Well, here's my disclaimer. That I want you to know that if you believe what I'm about to teach you, your life may be disrupted. There may be some things in you that die. You may get rid of some stuff. Hallelujah. Here's what I heard the Lord say to me, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper. I was so moved in my heart that I wrote it down and, and I, I want to share it with you today and I want you to hear it as a, as, a, as a prophetic word to us as a people. The Lord said to me, where is the roar of my people? Tell those who have been weary from the battle, faint-hearted to lift their voice for the roar of the Lion of Judah is in their mouth. I am calling them to roar in prayer, in worship and in the place of the ultimate battle. For I am releasing restoration, resurrection, and renewing to those which will appear to be lost, to those things which have appeared to be lost, dead, or weakened. My righteous ones will experience an unprecedented awakening. Those who have lost their will to fight will suddenly be endued with power from on high. I am bringing a new season to this people and to this house. It's a season of recovery of things which have been lost, lost sons and daughters lost vision and dreams, lost passion, lost finances, lost purpose. For the dry ground will be watered by my spirit, declares the Lord of heaven. Call everyone to take their place, stand in their position, and to station themselves for the season of refreshing and restoration that I am bringing. For this is a war, declares the Lord, but the outcomes have been decreed by my promises to you. I'm going to open to you doors, places of influence, both in the church and in the marketplace. Doors will open because of your obedience in the quiet season. That time when I shut you up to faith, when there was nothing visible that your promise was going to come to pass and you still believed me. Because of that, this will be your day to enter in. For I have loosed you from every encumbrance so that you may rise and you may cross over. In this season, declares the Lord, I am revealing those who have been in hiding and in preparation. Those who others have declared were unqualified, uninvited, and overlooked. Those who've been clothed with the garments of humility and righteousness. For there is a holy remnant among you, and their faith will become contagious. I'm calling men and women who will not allow their children to be merchandised, marginalized, and maligned by hell anymore. I'm calling a band of warring mothers to arise. I'm calling for roaring fathers who will be heard in the night hours. Family altars are being rebuilt and the brokenness in marriages and families will be healed. Do not say, oh, this is just like before. For I declare to you that even in the midst of great cultural upheaval and seeming disruption, my kingdom shall be established. Those who declare my reign in the earth will see the glory of their king in their midst. For the righteous shall be bold as a lion. Where is the roar of my people? For your enemy roars seeking who he may devour. But I say to you, there is a greater roar. There is a roar coming up from the house of God. There is a roar coming from the altar of the Lord. It is the sound of triumphant people standing before the throne of grace, making their petitions known to God. For this roar will be heard by all those who have ears, who have been attentive to heaven. So therefore arise from your slumber and begin to roar, declares the, how, the voice of the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe there ought to be a roar come up out of here right now. Oh! Just 
Please be seated. This is the first Sunday in January. I'm going to prophesy by the last Sunday in December, there will be a continual roar in this house. Jay and I were called, I don't even know if he was with me the first time, but for several years I went to a city in Canada called Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And I got invited because the church had been in a season of continual revival. People were being born again, deliverances were happening, people were walking really in a realm of glory that was unbelievable. And when I went to speak, the pastor invited me to attend the morning prayer meeting. And I thought, I don't know what that is. I mean, what does that look like? I mean, we'd, we'd had early morning prayer for years, but he said, no, I'm telling you, there's something different. You've not heard or seen what you're gonna see. So I left my hotel and I arrived at the church, like most good church people. I got there about three minutes before it started. And prayer started at 6.30 a.m. It had snowed the night before about eight or nine inches. I thought nobody will be there. And when I turned towards the parking lot, there was no room to park. An usher had to come and because I was the speaker, he'd provided and saved a place for me, but I didn't know where it was. And so I went to my spot and parked the car, got out. And when I stepped out into the parking lot of the church, church seated about 1, 1,200 people, I literally heard the roar of prayer coming out of the auditorium. I could hear the people praying in the parking lot. And I stopped and I said, I've never heard anything like that in my life. And I walked into the building and 750 people were walking, praying, believing God for their city, believing God for an outpouring. A few years later, I was privileged to go and preach with a man named Jim Cimbala who leads a great church called Brooklyn Tabernacle. And Jim went to Brooklyn Tabernacle when the church was just 25 or 30 people. They were about to shut the doors. And God said to Jim, he said, if you, Jim had been a basketball player, had no desire, was pastor in New Jersey, had no desire to go to Brooklyn. But he did it out of respect for uh, one of his family members. He said, I'll go and take care of the services. He said, when, it, when he went... He said, the Lord said to him, if you'll make the Tuesday night prayer meeting the center of the week, the focal point of the church. If you talk about Brooklyn Tabernacle today, most people think in terms of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, they're known all over the world. Won Grammy Awards, Dove Awards, Stellar Awards. But Jim said, he said, we made the Tuesday night prayer meeting the center of our church. And every Tuesday night, when I walked down the streets of Brooklyn, as much noise as in a city, I could hear a roar coming out of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Because every Tuesday night, 3,000 to 3,500 people gather to pray, to believe God for their city. Actually, he told a story about one time they were in the middle of July, and in the middle of July, they were praying three or 4,000 people were praying and the Holy Spirit told them to start singing a Christmas carol. And a guy off of the street heard the people singing and pray this Christmas carol and he had been a Wall Street investment banker, lost his family, become addicted, was living on the streets of Brooklyn. And he said, when I heard the Christmas carols being sung, he said, I thought I have lost my mind completely. Uh, I'm over the edge. It's somebody singing Christmas songs. I'm hearing Christmas songs in the middle of July. Wandered into the church, got born again, filled with the Spirit. Today he's one of their elders and on their pastoral staff. Because they learned how to pray by being led by the Spirit. 
What began with 20 or 30 people today is a church of eight or 9,000 every weekend and the impact of that church has gone all over the world. You say, Bishop, what are you talking about? I'm telling you, God is speaking a prophetic word over us and over you today. But none of it's gonna be done until we become, as a church, a house of prayer. And until you in your home once again have family altars. Prayer can no longer be an afterthought. It can't be something you do when there is no other answer. I mean, you know, lots of times we'll say, well, nothing else works, we probably ought to pray. We're going to be people who from the beginning say we ought to pray. All things are possible to those who believe. The writer of Hebrews says this, you come to God in faith because you believe he's real and you believe he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That means that we don't have the luxury of playing nice with prayer anymore. Not if we want our hearts to be made whole. Not if we want to reach our destiny. Not if we want God to build a fence of protection around our household. Not if we want God's favor to abundantly flow upon our lives. Not if we want the strategies of hell to be bound and return to the source from which they came. I'm asking every follower of Christ at the Gate Church to ask God in 2019 to give you a strategy for prayer. Just like you make goals for your individual life, your financial life, things you want to accomplish this year, I'm asking every person that can hear my voice, I'm hearing the Lord say, will you get a strategy for prayer? in 2019 here's why Ephesians chapter 6 verse number 10 through 12 in the New Living Translation says this here's the final word be strong in the Lord in the power of his might put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil for we're not fighting flesh and blood but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. How many of you in this room would be honest enough to say, Bishop, I've noticed something that the war that I'm involved in in my life, whether whether anybody knows about it, whether it's public or private, how many in this room would be honest enough to admit that the war that's being raged against you is being waged against you by something that has personality? It's not innate. It has an intimate awareness of who you are. It knows your pressure points. Does anybody in the room know what I'm talking about when, I, when I'm talking about the fact that, that hell knows what buttons to push in your life? In fact, the writer of Hebrews 12 calls them besetting sins. They're the things that always show up to trip us up. If we're honest, the devil doesn't have to get really new strategies for most of us. He just keeps repeating the same old stuff. Now, I want you to understand something. Satan is not a god. He is not God's equal. He's a created being. He's an imposter who plays God. He can't read your mind. Some of you thought, well, the devil's been reading my mind. He can't read your mind. He's not omniscient. But he does read your habits. I ain't got no help. I mean, you know, there's some things that if somebody could just follow you around and take enough notes, 
they'd figure out where your pressure points were. If you gave up hope every time your checking account and didn't have a certain amount of money in it, then how many of you know he'd know where to send the battle? Hmm? Everything you and I struggle over, he keeps account of. How many of you know that he not only can't read your mind, he can't predict your future? He can't tell you what your future is going to be. The devil cannot prophesy to you. What he can do is tell you the consequences of your choices. Hold on to your seat. He's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere. You say, well, the devil's been at my house today. Well, if he's been at your house, he can't be at mine. You say, well, then how is he working against all of us? Let me tell you how he works. He works through the systems of our world that seek to conform and shape your life. The way you think, the ideology that you appreciate and and appropriate in your life, that's how his dominion begins to have authority in the earth. He's not omnipresent. He's not God. But how many of you know that's why he works in the media? I ain't got no help. That's why he works in Hollywood when movies are produced. You ever notice that everything in culture, that, that, that our culture wants to shift, they create a sitcom about it. Because anything they can get you to laugh at, you'll eventually accept. That's how the world works. How many of you know if you want to, if you want to dismantle authority, then you end up making comedy about people who are in authority. Several years ago, when we wanted to remove the influence of men in our culture, we created a sitcom called Three's Company. And we made the man look like a bumbling idiot. Why? Because Satan can't be everywhere. The battle that buffs up against you is not Satan at your house. It's his ideology. It's his thought patterns. It's how he operates. It's by people you work with telling you, you ought to be mad. And because your Bible doesn't stand up in you, then you get in your car on your lunch break and go, you know what, I really ought to be. Who is that boss to tell me what he thinks I should be doing? And next thing you know, I'm in a war. I'm in a war for my life. Well, you got to... You got a right to rebel against your parents. Who are they to be telling you what to do? You're 17. You can understand the Pelagrium theory and they can't even understand how to spell it. I mean, if you know at that point, what am I doing? I'm in the midst of a battle. And the warfare comes from the strategies of the enemy. He knows what buttons to push. So here's what Paul said. Here's the answer that Paul gave to that. He said, so then finally, brethren, I want you to know you better put on the whole armor of God because not just every now and then, but every day of your life, you're going to be in a battle. And that battle, listen to me, loved ones, that battle is not won by debate. You don't win the battle by debate. There's only two things in the armor of God that he gave you that were offensive. The rest were defensive. He said, I want you to put on the helmet of salvation. In other words, I want you to cover your mind with the salvation that's come to you. I want you to put on the breastplate of righteousness. 
In other words, when he wants to come and bring accusation against you that you're not who you say you are, you say to him, no, 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 no. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm not righteous because of who I am. I'm righteous because of whose I am. I put on the belt of truth. In the Roman soldier's day, the thing that held everything together was the belt. It held his breastplate in, pro, in place. It held his sword. It held his whole uniform in place. Why? Because truth is central to everything. How I many of you know truth is not what you think it is and truth is not what I think it is? Truth is what God says it is. Oh, I didn't get a whole lot of amens, but I'm going to keep preaching. Because truth is not a, 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 a system of philosophy. Truth is a person. Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth. Put on your, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith that quenches every fiery dart. And then here are your two offensive weapons. And take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Quit fighting your battles with, well, I'll tell you what I think. Who cares? Opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got a couple of them. Who cares what you think? Who cares what I think? Take up, if you're in this battle, take up your sword and begin to say, you know what? The national media tells me that my stocks went down 100, 700, 800, 1,000 points. But here's what my sword says. My God shall supply everything I have need of according to his riches in glory. And then here's the other weapon you have. Watch what he says in verse 18. Put this on the board for me. Ephesians 6, 18. Can y'all throw that up on the screen? Read this with me out loud. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. You notice what he says? He says three things that are significant. He said, I want you to pray Pray in the Spirit. Everybody say that with me. Pray in the Spirit. Say it again. Praying in the Spirit is not just praying in tongues. It means that the source of your prayers is not yourself. You pray by Holy Spirit direction. You pray through the strength of the Spirit. Come on, be honest. How many of you in this room have ever said, I don't feel like praying? I know I ought to, but I don't feel like praying. That's because somewhere we believe we're the source of our prayers. But he said, if you're really going to pray where you can do battle and overcome these strategies of, the hell, of hell and the strategies of your enemy, you have to pray in the spirit. You have to pray prayers that are empowered and directed by the Spirit. He's the source of your praying. That's why every believer needs to make sure they have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to teach a lesson in these five about what it means to have a spiritual language. And I know some people get nervous about that. They say, you know what? I want Jesus. I just don't know if I want that Holy Ghost thing. 
Let me just say to you, you can't have Jesus if you ain't got the Holy Ghost thing. Because the only thing that brought you to the Father was the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit becomes the source of your life. He becomes the source of our praying. Pray in the Spirit. Say that with me. Then he said this, on all occasions. In other words, he's the source, and then you need to learn to pray systematically. On all occasions. On all occasions. I'll try that one more time. On all occasions. I want to challenge you in 2019 that you get systematic about your prayer time. To me, it's not important that you pray an hour. Several years ago, there was a lot of teaching that went on in America. Could you not tarry for one hour? And if you can tarry for an hour, that's wonderful. But for some people in this room, it'd be great if you just got 10 minutes systematically. I ain't feeling no love right now. I need to feel some love. Uh If you just systematically set apart some time, this is my prayer time. Let me ask you a question. How many of you pray more when you're in trouble? Hold your hand up. Let let me take a vote. How many of you pray more when you have big troubles going on? Hmm? Some of you don't want to vote like this. It's like... uh, You might as well tell the truth and shame the devil. If you pray more when you're in trouble, I mean, you know, that may be why God keeps you in trouble. Because if that's the only time he can talk to you, then I mean, you know, he just keeps letting it show up at your house. Because he wants to have a conversation with you. He said, I want you to pray in the spirit and I want you to pray on all occasions. That means I want you to pray when everything's going hellacious. When all hell's breaking loose, I want you to pray. And when everything is going well, I want you to pray. And when you got everything you need, I want you to pray. And when you got nothing you need, I want you to pray. Because nothing happens apart from prayer. He said, I want you to pray in the spirit. That's the source. I want you to pray on all occasions. That's systematically. And I want you to pray, watch this, all kinds of prayers. How many of you realize there's more than one type of prayer? We're going to talk about that over the next several weeks. There's more than one type of prayer. Sometimes you may come to the place of prayer and God says to you, I want you to pray petitioning prayers. Make your petitions known to God. Tell him what you need. Pray your prayer list. There may be sometimes you come to prayer and he wants you to travail because you're giving birth to something. Come on. There may be sometimes he wants you to pray the prayer of faith where you're making declarations over certain things in your life and it doesn't look like anything's happening and there's nothing to support it. But you stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, that sickness is leaving my house, that affliction is leaving my children, that addiction is leaving my family line, and I declare it in the name of Jesus. So he wants you to pray by the source who is the Holy Spirit. He wants you to pray on all occasions, which is systematically. And he wants you to pray all kinds of prayers, which means he wants you to pray strategically. Strategically. There's nothing worse than you trying to make a petition when God wants you to be groaning in travail. Sometimes I come to my place of prayer And I do what Romans chapter 8 says. I don't have any words. All I can do is go, God. Oh, God. 
Oh, God. You say, well, that's not praying. Yes, it is. Because the Spirit prays according to the will of God with groanings and intercession that we don't know anything about. And when the Spirit prays, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 28, when the Spirit prays according to the will of God, then we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. No, you cannot claim that all things are going to work out if you didn't pray. Well, I just believe everything's going to work out in my life. No, it ain't, darling. You can't pick the Bible apart and take it out of context. The context of Romans 8, 28 comes out of Romans 8, 26 and 27 that we pray with groanings and intercession by the power of the Spirit. Then we know. Am I doing okay? That's why we wanted to get strategic and we wanted to get systematically in this house. I know people can't come at 8 o'clock on, in the mornings most of the time. If you're working, if you're retired, you can be here. A 30-minute prayer meeting. We will probably live stream it on Facebook. If you're at work and want to watch, tune in or whatever you can do. I told them to open the building here to pray for personal prayer. Just so you could have a sanctuary. On your lunch hour, if you, could live, if you work on the northwest side and you can get here. This building will be open so that you can come in, walk in this auditorium, sit in quietness, meditate, pray, believe God. Music will be playing. There will be a pastor in here. Every morning it's going to be at 8 o'clock, Monday through Thursday, in the yellow building upstairs in the cave room. There will be worship. There will be prayer. We're going to pray corporately. Corporately. Because it's important that we pray together. Hmm? Romans, I mean, Acts chapter 2. They were all together in one place, in one accord. And what were they doing? They were praying. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Acts chapter 4, verse number 31. And when they were all together, they lifted their voice in prayer. And the place where they were gathered together was shaken. Boom! Critical mass. I believe this. I believe if on Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night, I'm believing if we have 500 people in this room, we're going to release a power of glory and miracles and breakthroughs that we have never experienced before because we've never had 500 people come together to pray. But this week, we shift the culture at the gate church because we recognize we're going to be fervent in prayer. Is anybody going to help me? We're going to be systematic and we're going to be strategic. I want to tell you something. That's why the next Monday night for, for our first Monday night at the gate, I invited Bob Hazlitt to return. Bob Hazlitt was here about two years ago and gave one of the most significant prophetic words to this house that had ever been given. And we're living out some of the things that happened. I asked him to return for a night of miracles healing and ministry because when we finish praying for these next seven days critical mass earth shaking history writing change is going to take place are we in agreement let me close with this he said I want you to pray 
with your passions. If you believe he's a rewarder, I want you to pray with passion. The effectual fervent prayer. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you're going to have to get, at, you're going to have to get after it in prayer. Come on, just tell him. You're going to have to get after it in prayer. I don't have time. These guys are going to have to set this up for me again next week. But all I want to say is this. When you lose and become dull and lose your cutting edge, God wants to restore it. He wants to give it back to you so that you don't have to keep laboring at something that seems to not be working. But you recognize when that cutting edge, that sharp edge comes back because you've restored your prayer life to a place it's supposed to be. You begin to see God work in ways like you've never seen him before. How many, how many of you are ready for a year where you don't have to work near as hard but you see twice as many miracles? See, come, come on, Ashley. See, I just believe when this house becomes a house of fervency, a house of prayer, we're not going to have to have worship leaders that tell us, lift your hands, come on, somebody shout, somebody dance. You know what's going to happen? Before people get out of the parking lot, what, can you imagine what would happen if people got out of their car in the parking lot and heard a roar coming up from this house. I've, I've asked them, we've shifted some things on the front end of our service, it's gonna be done different, gate happiness is gonna be done in the, in the foyer, and the reason is because I want people when they get in this room, there's gonna be music pray, playing before service. When you get in this room, I want you to start walking and believing God for, for miracles to happen, the power of God to be present. I'm believing there's gonna be folks that's gonna come 10 minutes early, not just to talk and fellowship, but to invite the presence of God, to invoke the blessings of God, to be upon this house, so that when we start, heaven opens and downloads the portals of glory will be open over our life because we're gonna be fervent. <laughs>